Today, I have the pleasure of having a dear friend and a leader, a staunch progressive, um, Sue Alman, the executive director of New Jersey Working Families. Uh, and it's such a pleasure of having her join us because she is leading the fight uh, to promote and establish progressive politics in New Jersey. Hi, Sue. Hey there, it's wonderful. Thanks for having me. Yes. Um, so, you know, I have been, when I was thinking about who I wanted to have in this show to begin this discussion with activists, um, I thought of you because you sort of are carrying the, the, the vanguard here for progressive politics for all of us. Um, and I, you know, with the death of uh, Josh um, Ginsburg, um, I began to read her, her biography. Um, and I find her life so inspiring, you know, how she was, uh, you know, super smart, top of her class. She had a hard time getting a job and she eventually ended up being such a stout progressive for women and fighting in the courts. As John Lewis used to tell us, you got in good trouble uh, <laughs> to, uh, to, to make change happen. So what trouble, what good trouble are you in right now? Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of good trouble happening. Um, and I think what that day showed in that day was um, I wasn't the only one removed that day. There was a lot of, of conversations that, that happened before and during that day, um, many of which are still happening now. So yeah. how is New Jersey handling its budget? Um, how, are we, uh, how are we envisioning and imagining community development? Um, the reason a bunch of activists from Camden City, which is where I live, but also where these tax incentive programs had run wild, um, the reason those folks were there at that hearing that day was because they were protesting the injustice of why should um, politically connected, really wealthy CEOs be the beneficiary of what was essentially an open door to the state treasury uh, for their own personal gain. And of course, you know, the powers that be, the way they are in Trenton, um, didn't like to hear that voice of dissent on, uh, on this important day where they were going to be able to tell their side of the story about how great trickle down economics was going to work for a place like Camden, which is obviously complete nonsense. Um, so there were a lot of people there that day getting into all kinds of good trouble. And that is continuing. So we have all kinds of fights happening. Uh, we had a victory last week with the millionaire's tax, which is a huge yes, yes. for progressives. Yes. Yeah, we, we um, get to talk a little bit of those campaigns. Okay. I want you to talk a little bit of how can people getting um, get connected to all this uh, positive energy that is happening. You know, one of the reasons I decided to uh, start this discussion with activists for activists um, about what inspires uh, us to continue fighting for what we believe in is that because after the um, the primary election, you know, we were all excited. Uh, either with Warren or with Bernie, and so many activists were out there uh, raising issues um, against uh, income inequality, a climate change, opportunity for young people. So once, you know, now we're in a primary, and I want to be able to uh, talk about what does it take to continue that momentum that we had in the primary into this general election, and because New Jersey is a blue state, we usually don't get that much attention from the national politics into New Jersey. So um, how, what inspired you to continue working so hard for progressive politics in New Jersey? Because we are a blue state, but in many ways, we, you know, the, pro, the politics are not that progressive. We have to really work hard for it. So what inspires you to do that work? So I actually love New Jersey's dynamics um, in that they're so interesting and so surprising. So what inspires me to do this work, I got my start as an education activist, um, being against high stakes testing, being against school privatization. And when I moved to Camden, which is where I live now, um, where I am right now, um, <laughs> the, the city was in the middle of, of being taken over in a bunch of different ways. And one of them was school privatization. Um, and so it really made me recognize, and I hope that there's any lesson that progressives can take away from this era, this horrible, horrible Trump era, is that Trump is not an anomaly. He's a little bit uh, uh, the bubbling up of these problems that exist, yes, even here in New Jersey, which is technically a blue state, um, and that we have to fight for progressive values in our hometowns, in our cities where we live, in our state, in our counties. Um, there's a lot of money and a lot of opportunity to be better here in New Jersey. And because we're a blue state, 
we should be at the vanguard of progressive change. And I think with Governor Murphy being uh, our governor, yeah. that has really pushed the conversation forward. But if you look back when Chris Christie was governor, many Democrats, especially those in South Jersey, but all across the state, cozied up with Chris Christie to do things that Republicans would have been thrilled about and were thrilled about. And it was done under the guise of bipartisanship. So I think in New Jersey, we have to be, we can't just rely on the like framework that MSNBC gives us about how to understand the world. We have to apply our own thinking caps to the situation and be really critical with our Democrats and our Republican state and local legislators because they can do better. We are a rich state, we're a powerful state. We have plenty of wealthy people. We have lots of, we have lots of money in our, in our coffers. How we spend that money is really, really critical. And that happens at the municipal level all the way up to the state. One of the things that I always uh, um, focus on is that New Jersey is sort of like at the vanguard of where, where the national politics are going. Um, you know, we had a year of Chris Christie, which was a very conservative in his politics, but yet we were organizing in the ground to get the minimum wage uh, increase mm -hmm. eventually when, uh, when Murphy, Governor Murphy got elected. So it's sort of an example that you have a progressive governor and yet you have to continue to organize to make sure that progressive policies get enacted by a progressive governor. So you uh, at the Working Families have been at the forefront of organizing people around progressive politics so that we can create a momentum to get them passing to law and then signed by Governor Murphy. So can you tell us a little bit of the uh, maybe one of the, the, the greatest things that I think that, that we're here now that we've been building for is the millionaire tax. But in addition to that, how do, can you sort of tell us how do we get there to the fact that we are talking now about a millionaire tax, and what else can we help you get done in New Jersey? Yeah, so I mean, the fight for the millionaire tax was alongside. I mean, way predates me. I mean, I started here a little over a year ago. That fight had been going on since I think like for a decade, um, and I know that you were probably involved in it. Folks across the state were involved in it, as well as the uh, minimum wage bill and other worker protections during that era. And the millionaire's tax was something that the Democratic state legislature always voted for when Christie was governor because they knew it would never come law. Yeah. And the minute Governor Murphy came into power and, and he was like, yeah, let's do this, you guys. You guys are for it. I'm for it. Let's make it happen. They stopped voting for it. And it was like, how does this make any sense? Yeah. So then, you know, a coalition of, of folks over the last several years have been pushing this. Um, it includes labor unions. It includes organizing. Uh, on the ground organizers, it includes the grassroots groups who sprung up during the post-Trump era. It includes folks who are fighting for all kinds of issues in their home communities, all coming together and saying, look, we can afford things in New Jersey if we tax the wealthiest folks, the people who are earning over a million dollars. And the marginal tax rate increase is not that great, yet it produces this huge amount of wealth. And so there's been great research by New, Jer New Jersey Policy Perspective, some great organizing by folks like Make Broad, New Jersey Citizen Action, uh, Working Families, um, the environmental community, um, to really get this thing forward. Because, and then of course, the labor unions who have been fighting for this for a long time, like CWA and NJEA and, and 32BJ and others. So having a coalition on the left, um, everybody doesn't always have to agree on everything. But if we can all say, look, this is one thing that's really good for the state, let's join together and let's fight for it, we can affect change. And I think that's the millionaire's tax is the, the culmination of that type of organizing on the ground, all the way on up. Yes, and, and long-term organizing, long-term planning. Uh, and one of the things that I, I, like, I like to tell activists is that sometimes we don't win all our campaigns, we don't win, all, we don't have victories right away but we keep building. And I think that the millionaire's tax is one of the things that um, that we have been building for for a long time. Absolutely, and I think that's a really great point because I think in progressive, in the fight for justice, most of the time you're gonna lose <laughs> until you eventually chip away and win. But you're gonna fail and you're gonna struggle and you're gonna be doing completely unglamorous, under-resourced work for a really long time to get something through and you're going to have meetings where nobody comes and you're going to have events nobody attends and you're going to try something and it's going to fail and they're going to come after you and attack you. Yeah. Okay. That's part of the justice. That's part of the arc 
That's part of that's part of the movement. That's that's the work is yeah. dealing with the facts. Yeah, let me stop you right there because one of the things that I always um, I, I focus on is like what inspire you to keep fighting for that change, even when you feel nobody else does. So I know that you grew up in Hunterton County, uh, where I live now. And it's yes, beautiful. Hardcore of How did I say hi? <laughs> and it's uh, the hardcore of uh, Republican politics when you were growing up. I, I think yeah. it's changing. We're making Hunterton County blue. Um, but I, um, what, what turn like what turned you into progressive politics? Uh, you, you know, as as a as a uh, as a woman growing up here in Hunterton County, what's the spark that told you this is what I care about? And I'm going to make it my life mission to do this work. So for me, it was a it was a process. Um, it was a process of learning and unlearning. Um, in Hunterdon County, I grew up in a very very white, fairly well to do community. Hunterdon County is white and fairly well to do. Yeah. And going through my 20s, particularly in college, I went to Columbia University, which was very different demographically. Obviously, being in Manhattan and being in a much more diverse community. Um, going through a process of unlearning the things that white American culture teaches you about what is what is good and what is bad, frankly. And having to confront those biases, having to unlearn them, having to having to put your own pride and and understanding of identity on the back burner and listen to new ideas and confront those things. Um, and then understand your role in this this march towards justice. And you can either be part of the injustice, which is the default setting, or you can say, no, I'm gonna put my time and talent and energy into undoing yeah. this injustice. And that's a process and a journey that people go on, that people should go on, white people need to go on. Um, and it's gonna look different for everybody. Yeah, it, I wanna focus there because we have this debate right now around, around how to dismantle racism and racist institutions. And how do we all become aware of our own privileges? Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a, I am an immigrant woman, but I also have a lot of education and I had a lot of opportunities. And there's some level of, of privilege that comes with that that I cannot equate my life or my experience to, to an immigrant woman who perhaps is undocumented. So how did you, what was the process like for you personally to engage in the process of recognizing your own privilege, you know, mm -hmm. as, a, as a white woman with upper class background that needed to understand that to become uh, the activist in, 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 in attack those uh, structural issues that we face here in New Jersey, but in the country, not just in New Jersey. Yeah. yeah, yeah. no, I'm glad you framed it that way because it really is a process, right? It just doesn't happen. You don't just wake up in the morning and say, okay, I've solved my inner racism, now what? Yeah. Um, it's an ongoing process and it's an ongoing checking of, okay, what are my motivations here? Who have I gone to for information? Like, where am I getting information from? What am I privileging in this in this room, in this scenario, in this power dynamic? And I do think thinking of it as power um, is really helpful. And for me, that was probably the framework that I used through you know my adulthood as I as I navigated the space and continue to. Like, I am not perfect. I am not like you know I don't win any awards <laughs> for this, and no one should. So one of, I ask you this question because some of your critics uh, say, you know, uh, you are from Candon. You're very proud that you live in Candon now. And some of your critics say, why, why is a white woman criticizing the re renaissance of Candon? So and I think you being able to sort of put yourself in the, you know, in a position that you said, this is why. I, you know, so I want to I want to bring up to like, why was that process for you to understand that you, th you do have some privilege that people in Canada didn't, but that you can speak for that community as well. So yeah, and I think I push back on the couple things there. One is that I don't think Canada is having a renaissance. I think there's a, a segment of the city geographically that is transforming, but I think that intersects with a lot of conversations about whiteness and space and gentrification and to whom is this development meant to serve um, and who's getting the benefit of that. Um, and then the second thing is I try to be very careful not to speak for Camden, I am sitting in Camden um, and I organize alongside folks who have been here far longer and organizing far longer in this city than I have, um, but making sure that I'm centering those voices and we are as a movement centering those voices and me being able to help and lend a hand and lend a perspective and lend some capacity where I can help. 
Um, that's how I see my role as that. And I think, look, I think Camden has been um, a place that has gotten the brunt of environmental racism, of segregation, um, of, of racism in terms of power dynamics. Like where is the money going? Where is it coming from? Who's it benefiting? Um, and all of it, frankly, in my opinion, Camden is the greatest window into structural and sustained racism that I've had the you know unfortunate uh, privilege in some ways yeah. of seeing firsthand because it's so blatant. Yeah. So I, I want to say that just the fact that the critique uh, that you are a white woman speaking about Camden um, and yet a white man can speak about Camden and mm -hmm. it's okay for him to do it. To me, the inequity, the gender discrimination on that frame is just uh, unbelievable to me. Right. Uh, you know, so we have to acknowledge that because it is okay for uh, him to be a savior of Candom, but uh, you know, you criticizing what's not what what some of the faults are uh, is seen as a problematic. So uh, well, that was standard that women in politics or in this work have to live with, right? Yeah. Right, and women of color having to deal with both the racist yeah. implications of their identity as well as the gendered ones. Um, yeah. As, and, know, I, and I think that what you have done is sort of elevate the voices and the struggles of Candon by the ability that you have through being the director of working families to do that work. Because institutions matter, and I think that working families yeah. as an institution has been able to elevate what the struggle in Candon means for development in cities across New Jersey. So I'm glad you said that about institutions. I think that's really critical. I think one of the things that Camden, um, the resource, the, the institutions here that have political power to fight back against one of the most sophisticated and well-resourced political machines in the country, those institutions are very under-resourced. Um, I would argue by design, right? The people who are squeaky wheels, who are complaining, or not complaining, but launching valid criticisms against the way Camden is treated are often shut out of the conversation by design. And that shutting out can include a removal of resources or not being allowed to be at the table um, or be part of that conversation. So, yeah, so just those, the, the voices have been saying this in Camden, like the, for example, the Camden NAACP chapter has been saying this for a long time. Um, so making sure that those folks are, given a platform to say the things they've always been saying is, I think, a role we can fill sometimes. Um, I want to make clear that because you're, you're living in Candon, the attention has been in what's happening in Candon, but the critique about the lack of economic policy that invests in poor working people applies to to applies to a uh, Newark, applies to Jersey City, applies to in Atlantic City. So it's, uh, it's uh, an effort to elevate what does New Jersey need to do to invest in working families of all across the state? How can they engage with the work that you're doing around different areas um, so that, that they don't understand that the, the economic issues are one thing, but there's so many other campaigns that you guys are working on. Can you mention some of those and then and tell, tell us how can activists young people get involved with New Jersey working families? Absolutely, no. So so one of them, so we're working in coalition with a lot of different groups. Um, so the bills that we're looking at right now that we are supportive of, that we really like, and we think are, are part of this march towards justice, one just got signed, which is the environmental justice bill yes. around air pollution, which we really liked um, because it was, it, it's the, one of the most progressive ones in the entire country, if not the most progressive air pollution bill, which is fantastic because it finally recognizes that uh, environmental justice communities um, should not be sacrifice zones to these industries that use them for dumping purposes and that the cumulative effect is what matters. It's not just the singular effect. So I think that bill was terrific. And that was a long fight for decades led by folks, um, the Newark Iron Brown Community Corporation, Food and Water Watch, um, Environment New Jersey, uh, the Alliance for uh, Environmental Justice, all kinds of folks who've been leading that fight for a really long time. So that was a great win um, for progressives and for communities uh, like Camden and Newark and Atlantic City and other places. Um, another bill we liked yesterday, just yesterday, there was the uh, People's Caravan for the People's Bill on Evictions. Yes. Um, that is sponsored by Brittany Timberlake, Assemblywoman Brittany Timberlake. She's doing a great job with that bill. Um, it's been, uh, it's now stalled in the Senate, um, which is South Jersey controlled, and that's a problem. 
Um, you know, we believe that people should not be evicted during a pandemic and that there should be relief for home for people who, um, you know, need it during this during this crisis time. And Assemblywoman Timberlake has a bill that is supported by um, a lot of very good organizations from Fair Share Housing to the Housing Community Development Corporation. Um, and we, we, you know, support that bill as well. So I think folks who want to get involved, I mean, if you follow us on Twitter, um, we oftentimes like we had a petition that went out the other day about that. Um, about that particular bill. And then of course, right now we have, oh, and there's all our contact information, perfect. Yeah. Um, follow us on Twitter because that stuff is always getting up, always out there. Um, join our mailing list because that's a great place to go. And then of course, like I would be remiss to mention, to not mention the elections that are happening in November. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's a little bit of like, the house is burning down. New Jersey's stuff is really important. And we also have to make sure that, you know, our country, survives <laughs> so a lot of our energy right now in a unique way because typically we're, we're very new jersey focused almost exclusively is now on working in some of the swing states like taking our volunteers and our organizers here in new jersey and working to you know leverage volunteer energy in swing states to get the senate flipped and to get joe biden elected so that is even though that's usually not in our wheelhouse right now that's of paramount importance and then the final piece is down in South Jersey, deep South Jersey. So we have a couple of congressional races that are busy in New Jersey and will be competitive. Amy Kennedy's race in CD2 to flip that district away from Jeff Van Drew is a big one. We love that race because yes. uh, Van Drew was a traitor and he switched parties. Um, we also like Andy Kim's race in CD3. That's going to be a close race. And then yes. you have Mikey Sherrill and Tom Malinowski in NJ11 and 7, um, Hunterdon County on day 7. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have to, you know, make sure that those that those districts stay firmly blue as well. Um, but that's not where the work stops, because once the folks are in power who are blue and Democrat, that's great. But that's when we have to push them on the issues. So at this point in September 2020, we are toggling between state issues and also making sure that the electoral situation is tenable for the country moving forward. Yes. And I, I believe that it's not just about winning the White House and getting Joe Biden elected, and I'm glad you are hosting weekly phone banks to get that done, calling other states. But it's also maintaining our our, um, our strength in the House and perhaps uh, helping flip the Senate so that we can actually, you know, not allow uh, the Supreme Court to con to continue going. Um, the oh. Yeah. So how can activists? get engaged in the phone banking uh to great question yeah so i'm actually putting together an email right now that's going to go out to our mailing list with all the ways to get involved um we're partnering with working families pennsylvania to do stuff in philadelphia both in person so if you're within striking distance of pennsylvania you can do things in person like register people to vote and have them vote early that very same day so that can all be done in a one-stop shop awesome. and phone banking um in those states and we have great partners uh, up and down the state. So if you're located in um, Essex County or you're located in NJ11 or you're located in some of these other places, there are partners who are doing work um, in those particular districts as well. And so we're actually putting together a little bit of a resource that compiles a lot of what's going on across the state that I think I'll put on the um, the website as well. I'm doing it as an email right now, but it might be a great resource for yeah. them. For so people to go visit and perhaps sign up uh, to, to join you, because I think that one of the things that we need to give People is a way to get engaged since yeah. we're not we're not a, a targeted state. We, we usually don't get to do things locally. So um, if we can, uh, uh, we'll put the website so that people can get engaged. Perfect. I'll put it all up on there because it's uh, it's very important and this is crunch time. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, electoral politics matters. Yeah. So another thing, we are in national national politics. We need to keep the Senate. We need to win keep the uh, win the Senate and keep the House. Um, sometimes those races feel like they're federal, it doesn't matter locally, but I also know that New Jersey Working Habit Families has a platform to, um, to train and to uh, identify the next bench of progressive politics mm -hmm. politicians in New Jersey. So if, um, how, do, how can young people who are interested in progressive politics, how can they get connect to this work at the local level um, so that they can build a platform to change politics locally and change politics in New Jersey. 
It's a great question. So starting in 2021, we're going to be partnering with our national organization to do candidate training events and not just for candidates themselves, but for also like running candidates. Um, if you want to be a campaign manager and things like that. Um, so we put that on pause. We we're going to start this year. And because of COVID and because of the elections heating up, we said, OK, you know what? We're going to put that off to early 2021. Um, but I would say that in an ad hoc fashion, we're doing that. Um, so we haven't done an event yet but we've done ad hoc fashion all across the state. So we um, we attempted to run freeholder candidates in South Jersey this past year. Um, one of them ended up winning. Um, yeah. And apparently yeah. the first we think off the line freeholder candidate to win her primary race ever. And she's now running in the general. So that's a huge deal. Um, and I think what we'll be doing is working with our board and our affiliates to make sure we choose a couple of races in 2021 that we will recruit surgically for at the same time doing what you said, which is building a long-term bench of folks we can pick from and work with um, who would be great candidates moving forward. So this, these are, you know, small, not small, but like you have to build a base and move up and be strategic. Um, and so the great news is our board, our affiliates um, are incredibly experienced, very knowledgeable about state politics. So we work with them to figure out, you know, where this ship is going to be steered next. One question that I get a lot from um, progressive uh, activists who are interested in running for office, but they try and they cannot make it. Um, you know, and I tell people we need to support working families. Um, you know, in New Jersey, we have this a strong uh, county party system. Uh, you know, it's hard to run, you know, like if you are an, an insurgent or an independent candidate, uh, it's so hard to sort of beat the machine in many ways. And I know that you have you have a campaign and an effort to to, to change those dynamics. I know, in, I know in New York State, the Working Families Party can run on a line. We cannot do this in New Jersey. So what is your strategy to break into those structural uh, problems that we have where insurgents and progressives have a hard time winning? Yeah, New Jersey has a huge problem. Um, we have this ballot system, the county party system, this thing called the line, which privileges um, county the county party's choices for these different offices. It makes it very difficult for progressives or anybody, frankly, yeah. to run off the line because it's like starting a race down a lot of points. Um, yeah. There's been some research on that recently, and it's a real issue. So I think it's a case-by-case analysis. So what we did in CD2 was we knew that Amy Kennedy had, you know, really strong uh, name recognition, really like really powerful, like she would be a really powerful uh, figure to go up against the yeah. um, the party. And so we tried to hitch our candidates to her. So that was like a, a strategy kind of tailored to CD2. If we were to challenge state legislators in 2021, we will need to navigate this process. So that means we either have to also run county freeholders, yeah. um, to give them a chance to have a bracket, or you can run an inside strategy and try to get them to get on the line, make, give them the party blessing, which is a complicated equation. Yeah. Um, or you can try to run as a bullet off the line and make sure that you're well-resourced. I do think the evidence shows that if you have resources, you can overcome a lot of the advantages of the line. The problem with progressives have is oftentimes they have neither of those things. They don't have the line or any resources, and that makes it really difficult to win. Yeah, but we think if we can concentrate the left's resources on a couple different seats, we can be competitive. How do you respond to the critique? Because I have I have had this critique on thrown out myself that we, you know, I am a Democrat. I know you're a Democrat. We are we proud Democrats. But sometimes when you go against the status quo of how elections are run or you challenge incumbents who perhaps are not doing the right thing, you get painted as not a true Democrat or an outsider. Um, and how have you managed that, uh, that to survive those critiques and still be able to claim your place as a Democrat in this, in this state? So it's a great question. The one thing I've learned over the past couple of years as being the target of many an attack, many of an attack, mailers, emails, phone, like you name it, I've gotten it. And yeah. not just me, but our allies too, is no matter what you do or how you're fighting, whether you're to this or to that, whether you shop at Aldi's or shop at the farmer's market or drive a Prius or drive a Honda, they are going to attack you for that. 
Yes. So it doesn't really matter. If they don't like you, they will attack you. So they'll call you too right wing. They'll call you too progressive. I mean, I've been called a communist and a Republican. So <laughs> all, the, all, the, all the isms, yes. So yeah. I think exactly. So, I mean, I don't know how all those things can be true at once. Yeah. Um, but I think like we just have to persevere with the belief system that we have and that we it's OK to have a little nuance. It's OK to be we're going to challenge Democrats in the primary. And you know what? Bernie Sanders didn't win. Elizabeth Warren didn't win. So now we're going to get on board with Joe, Joe Biden. That's an OK worldview. Like that's completely rational. And so if people don't, you know, I, I completely adhere to that. I think that we should fight like hell in the primaries. And then most of the time, especially when the future of our country is at stake, get on board with the eventual winner. One thing that I tell activists at the local level, and specifically um, activists of color, women, you know, young black and brown kids, is you do have to be OK with, uh, you know, being outsider sometimes, mm -hmm. but building and doing the hard work of build locally. Uh, and, you know, um, we at Lupe, I, I am I involved with Latinas United for Political Empowerment. And we, we push for more Latinas, more women to run at the local level, even for county committee, because sometimes those decisions get made there and they, the, the, the blowback is hard sometimes. So I always go back to this, how do, why don't we tell these young activists who are trying to break the barriers, like, how do you stay committed to the ideals of the party? And yet the same party sometimes rejects you. you know? well, it's really hard. And it can feel really, you know, especially like in our hyper-partisan world, like people identify as Democrats. They don't want to be rejected by the Democratic Party. But I think sometimes the healthiest thing for a party is to see it as a living document. It is not a stagnant thing. In New Jersey, we have people who've been in power since before some of us were born and it's okay for young people. It's okay for new folks who are just, doesn't have to be young people, just new people to be involved in those party decisions and be involved and to demand things like better bylaws. I mean, one thing we suggest uh, our county committee uh, candidates do is go in and if they get a seat to look at the bylaws of your county committee and say, hey, why do we do it this way? Why don't we have a secret ballot? Why doesn't you know, why don't we take a vote for every single uh, office that, you know, who's going to get the line? Why does the chair just get to decide? Um, and it can be really hard for the Democratic Party to, on one hand, talk about Joe Biden and how, you know, our, our country's uh, going to die of corruption and, and hypocrisy and Mitch McConnell. And on the other hand, do it right here in our county level in New Jersey. So I think if you're a savvy activist, you can use the Democratic Party's language and ideology against the county party system, because in many ways it looks more what we would call Republican in that it's or Trumpy um, in that it's like very much insider baseball. Um, and I think for a Democratic Party that should be open and, and welcoming to a panoply of voices, we should welcome uh, improvements into our structure and welcome the uh, the things to make it more equitable and fair, because that's what Democrats are supposed to be about. So I think we can uh, I think we can do both. Well, I, you know, I wanted to pick that point because we, there's so much energy with young people. They don't know where to put their energy. So I want them to understand that in the New Jersey Working Families uh, Alliance Party, we have so much activism happening that so many opportunities mm -hmm. to get engaged. Now, can you tell me a little bit quickly about uh, the, we in the Twitter, you know, uh, I know it's a little echo chamber, but we have the Take Back New Jersey Coalition. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit and how people can follow us on Twitter. I know. Oh my gosh, uh, yeah. So, yes. so Take Back New Jersey was is a coalition of a lot of different grassroots groups that were founded during the Trump era. And we, over the past like six months, we've been a little bit uh, quieter as a Take Back New Jersey as people have been focused on the, the federal election. But starting up again right after the federal election, we'll be back uh, to our full strength that we were in 2019. And it is a coalition of groups that are taking the energy and the focus and their education that they've learned at the national level and then applying that frame to New Jersey politics to make our state better so that people can feel like, like you said, you know, in New Jersey, we're not the focus of federal elections. We're going to be pretty blue. Um, yeah. So it's a way for people to take all this knowledge and energy and apply it to their local uh, state and their counties and to use each other as a network. Um, so we'll be launching that up again right after the election um, and we'll be really strong uh, into 2021 with that.
Awesome. Lastly, uh, you know, I'm a great and an activist for uh, immigrant worker justice and immigrant yeah. workers, and you guys were very supportive of the efforts on the driver licenses. But lately, you have been very vocal around the relief for all um, uh, efforts to uh, to get some relief to immigrant families yeah. affected by COVID-19. So, can you mention a little bit of that, so that to, for people to understand that working families works about the issues that impact working families and immigrants. Yeah our working families in your Yes, country. absolutely. So one of the biggest problems with both the federal budget and the state budget is that immigrants have been cut out. So immigrants who are uh, undocumented people who have been paying taxes as workers since you know they started working here in the United States or in New Jersey um, aren't getting any aid or any relief from these deals that are going to other folks. And you know these people are the backbone, backbone of our economy. Um, their healthcare matters, their worker rights matter, their relief, their families matter, their future of their families matter. Um, and we need to be just as serious about helping those people. They're part of our community. We need to be just as serious about helping them recover from this pandemic as we are every other resident of this state and this country. Um, and the, the being cut out of it. I mean, there's a great initiative here at Rutgers Camden. I was just talking to the student activists down there. You speak about students who have a lot of energy and, and good ideas. They're launching a fund to help undocumented people, DACA people yes, who are cut out of federal funding. And that's like a great, so as far as student organizing goes, they or, they found a problem, they came up with a, a way to solve it, and they're working with Rutgers and some partners to solve that problem. But it's a great example of how um, our immigrant friends and families, um, brothers and sisters are being cut out of things and how you know it shouldn't take private philanthropy to fill that gap. Yes. Awesome. I wanna. I wanted to just uh, thank you for oh, you. Being, continuing this energy statewide for for progressives to get involved. I encourage all progressive young progressives to sign up for New York yeah. City families and join us uh, in this fight, which is long. It's not. It's not yeah. going to to take back New Jersey and take back our progressive politics and continue on the legacy of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren yeah. and other progressive out there who are trying to make this country to be more uh, fair in its economic policies. I still believe that you are a, a notorious RBG and I, I know you know how to throw a punch. <laughs> Because you are a boxer, I hear so. I know, although I've, oh my gosh. <laughs> I love the picture. That was pre COVID. It's uh, staying in shape is a little different now. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to the many more punches you're going to throw uh, at all right. to criticize our efforts to have a progressive policy agenda in New Jersey. Oh, there's such so, women. That was a great group. Yeah, so much work to do. And please, everybody, sign up. Uh, to be a, become a member of New Jersey Working Families, follow yeah. follow Sue Altman uh, in her work that she does uh, trying to enact progressive policies in New Jersey. I thank you so much for inspiring thank you. Other women, for inspiring young women to to uh, you know recognize the power that they have to make change, even if you don't come from a place that uh, that you know, come from a middle class background. If you understand what's happening in this country, you have the power to help us change it. So thank you, Sue. Thank you, and thank you for all the work you do. You're incredible. Uh, thank you. We have, we have a great family uh, in the Progressive Family in New Jersey, and we, let's just keep bringing young people in so that, so that we can have a legacy left behind. Which is I love great. it. Thank you so much. This is thank you, Sue. Our role as activists is always to inspire the next generation to pick up the banner of progressive policies to fight for justice. This is a forum for us to take inspiration from the everyday battles that people are having to make their communities safer, to communities fair, and to have a voice in a political process. I am Dr. Patricia Campos Medina, and this is Activista Rise Up.